uh, right now I am uh, the uh, head of security research for a company called Bulletproof. I specialize in uh, breaking into casinos, hacking slot machines. Uh, we uh, were owned by a gaming labs uh, in Vegas. So uh, that's mainly what I do now, but I get to do government stuff as well on the side. And uh, that's about it. I'll tell you more later. I don't do anything that cool. Um, I'm a lawyer by trade, uh, focusing on data privacy, um, cyber insurance, cyber incident response, um, dabble in some cryptocurrency type issues. Um, very happy to be here. I definitely um, see hacking from like the post breach side, um, some you know white hat stuff. But uh, excited to answer any questions I can. Hi, I'm Andrew. I'm a uh, computer scientist at the University of Buffalo, um, and I focus on using programming languages to uh, protect from hacks rather than doing much hacking myself. Uh, so I know a lot more about the defense side than the attack side, but I'm happy to talk to you all about that. Hi, I'm uh, Isaac Sheff. I am also a computer scientist. I work in industry uh, for a company called Heliax, where I do distributed systems research, uh, focusing on security and interesting trust models and uh, the uh, blockchain space. So that's been an adventure. If you missed the blockchain panel earlier, um, well, it's here tonight, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a subset of today's panel. Okay, you're waiting for me, sorry. Um, okay, so uh, who would like to see some demonstrations? Okay, sounds good. All right, uh, now disclaimer, anything you see tonight, do not perform it against other people's systems without uh, permission. And make sure that the person you get permission from actually owns a system that you would be uh, hacking. Or j better yet, just hack your own stuff. But uh, we are not responsible for anything you do with this information. All right. So uh, let's. We're we're trying to. Windows machine you have sitting in the closet, gathering dust, breaking the hack. Hmm? Or VMs. VMs are good. Does does everybody use VMs in here? Does anybody you know. not know what a VM is? Okay, it's a virtual machine. It's when you have one computer, you have one computer that simulates another. So you can uh, work on the simulated computer and hack it without actually breaking it into anybody else's machine. Yeah, you would use hypervisors such as VMware Workstation, ESXi, um, Proxmox, stuff like that. Hyper-V, even. I hate Hyper-V, damn it. Key feature but, being that they're cheaper than just buying more hardware. Yeah. All right. Um, if you have a question, we'll, we'll ask you to come up to the mic and, yeah, and ask it. We're setting up something right now. I was going to say, uh, another great uh, thing to uh, try is if you're familiar with the website, try Hack Me or Hack the Box. Uh, especially try Hack Me. It's a great place to uh, start off and uh, practice uh, tons of simulations. Uh, and it'll definitely jumpstart you into the industry. Johnny cannot make it. Sorry. Yeah, can I get a mic check, please? Testing, this is testing. one of the mics. Right. Yeah. Um, See, audience participation yep, at its best. There it is. Perfect. Um, no, I sorry. As you guys were saying VM, it just kind of, uh, from I guess a hacking or attacking point of view, how does a Docker does that kind of kind of VM or does that not give you the same thing as a VM? Docker is kind of a VM, but not a VM at the same time. It's more of a container that you can run um, a very bare bones version of an operating system uh, or quasi operating system and uh, you can back up the container, uh, you can download new images, upgrade it easily. For right, I guess the question is like in the context of if you're attacking a Docker container, okay, would, would that essentially you're attacking the entire system or like in the same way that a VM would kind of be contained? In that? Uh, the, it should be contained at that point. I mean, it, it kind of depends on your entry point. Um, if your hack reaches out into the supervising operating system through, you know, syscalls and privilege escalation enough, uh, you can break out of a container more easily than you can break out of a VM. Mm -hmm. 
So okay. yeah, you may have just answered what I was going to ask, but kind of like if you're running a, a like an Amazon something on an Amazon server or something like that, that's your system, but not necessarily there. It's obviously not your equipment. Does that start to apply there, or any ideas how that? What Bre concerns you need to think about when you that sort of thing? Breaking out of an Amazon VM into the surrounding Amazon server is quite difficult, but there is some interesting research in the subject. I was actually thinking more. You've got your own Amazon server, so you want to basically use that as a, as what you're trying to tack into to see. So the thing to realize oh. is that it's very difficult to get your own Amazon server. Amazon wants to put you on their cloud system. Right. That's what um, and at that point, you're in a VM on their cloud system. Uh, so you can try to break out of that VM. Don't. You, theoretically, you could. Um, yeah. there, there's some interesting research on that and, and exfiltrating data from one VM to another. But it, mm. We're there's referring some to the row hammer attack. Yeah. The, where you can uh, corrupt the memory and get into another VM that way. I don't know if that was Amazon, though. Or a VMware. I mean, the Rohammer is a pretty general technique. It, it could work there. So there is some interesting research in breaking out of one VM into other VMs or, or the surrounding operating system on one machine. So it can be done, but it's comparatively rare in, in, in hacking space. I was thinking more in terms of you've got it on the two have Yep. Yeah, if you own an Amazon VM and you want to break into another person's VM running on the same physical server. No, I want to take Ah, right. So, um, I, I can answer some of that. Amazon does have a, a policy about pen testing uh, that if you want to try hack into your own servers, uh, uh, you have to notify them. It depends on how you're going to attack. But usually, if you do any everything, like if you put your attacking machine actually in the cloud next to the machines, you're going to attack. Uh, yes, and there is a great site, um, Snap IO, uh, Sap Labs IO, that you can sign up for free. Um, you can get yourself an Amazon account and hook it, uh, Snap IO into it, and they have hundreds of labs where they'll spawn a whole infrastructure, show you the network map, they'll spawn like 10 workstations that they do it on the cheap it's using something called CloudFront so it'll actually also tell me how much you're going to pay an hour for this lab and they're usually they're cheap it's like usually two three bucks uh, an hour for the lab but it will let you traverse a whole network and get a whole uh, a real simulation of uh, what you would do inside a network yeah, just make sure you turn it off when you're done. Or <laughs> so about the real bill. quick, I'm going to tell you guys something very important, and you're going to hate it. Read the terms and conditions, yeah. okay? <laughs> read your EULAs, okay? If you don't want to read them, then try to copy and paste them into a Word document or Google document or something like that, okay? And then Control F or Command F, right? And then think of different keywords that you might want to use or think about to kind of look at. All right, because when you click that little box that says, yes, I've read this, the court of law will assume that you've read it, irrespective of the sophistication of your reading or knowledge base. Okay, and then if you do have some questions, and if you are obviously coming at this from a white hat perspective or like a good faith perspective, just ask someone and say, hey, I'm curious about the security of X. I would like to test it on my own using my own methods. Am I able to do this? If I'm not, why not? And if I can do it, what do I need to do to make sure that I don't get in trouble for it? So this is a little bit more of a basic question. So if I have, uh, on a Fedora-based Linux system, let's assume that I'm root, and I'm running a Golang program that is literally just while true print yes. How do I break into that program as root and make it break out of that loop? How do I change the, the memory address of the of the while loop to say false, leave the program? Do I just need to learn how uh, ptrace works? So the, you're, 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 you're actually hitting on, on something I know quite a bit about. So you have to learn a lot about how your system deals with memory and in particular how it deals with program memory. And it's going to depend a lot on, on not just the operating system, and each version of Linux does it slightly differently, but also on your hardware. Um, because your hardware actually offers layers of, of, uh, of protection to the operating system itself. Um, but at some point, 
there is theoretically a way to go in if you can get through both hardware and operating system and whatever else protection you might have to go in and uh, the way a loop works when you compile it is it just says take this step this, if it's true jump to this part of memory otherwise jump to that part of memory and you could go change that address in theory but it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of systems it may just not be possible because we've been doing a lot of work to make sure that the hardware won't let you do that uh, so even when you're running uh, if you're root you oh no uh, you only attach a debugger when you're compiling so you have to actually make sure that when you compile you compile with debugger flags on otherwise all that information is lost in the binary so that that information isn't available in the binary um, you would also need uh, Sure, you you can you can get access to that. Um, so I, I mean, again, it's going to depend on exactly your system because each system does something slightly different. But um, at that point, without um, so the ptrace is going to tell you a lot more about system calls and maybe about stacks than anything else. Um, you might be able to find the return pointer, but it is going to depend on how your uh, compiler actually compiles that return pointer, um, and you ha you have to know about how that works. Um, and again, each compiler is going to do that slightly differently. So, you you can do it, but it requires understanding every layer of the stack very well at this point. Uh, so, are you talking about understanding the difference between stack memory and heap memory, or like oh, deeper than that? Let, let, let me let me let me try to be a little bit more clear. So, uh, yes, understanding the difference between stack memory and heap memory is important. So, um, stack memory is all of the local memory to some particular procedure. I, 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 I'm sure you know this. I'm, <laughs> I also want to make sure I, everybody else is following along. Um, so you have some local procedure. It has its own local memory. That's the memory of the stack. One of the things on the stack is what instruction do I run when I'm done with this procedure? That's the return pointer. And so you have to understand where on the stack that's going to be. Uh, and uh, you have to be able to change it when you're not supposed to be able to get access to that memory as another process. Um, theoretically, you could. Being root as an operating, on the operating system level is useful, but that's probably not your biggest challenge here. Your biggest challenge is probably getting overcoming the hardware protection, because that's going to be in a special part of memory that actually is is hardware protected to make sure the only kernel code can access that. So do segment fa segmentation faults happen at the CPU level rather than the operating system level? Uh, essentially, yes. But it depends on the particular segmentation fault. <laughs> <laughs> of course. It, yeah, it, I mean, that's a very... The, the answer to that question is, is kind it of... Depends. It happens all over the place. <laughs> if you need a note. Um, oh. To quote oh, Rich yeah, from earlier today... It depends. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have any particular recommendations on someone who's actively trying to learn this, like the book to go read? Like I've been reading uh, the Linux programming interface, and it's been helpful, but it, it's only telling me how the Linux kernel works. It doesn't tell me how to fuck with it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so in order to, to learn this stuff, you, you're, there's not going to be a book, because we're talking about learning an entire stack really well. It's it's a whole library of information you're going to need, I'm afraid. Okay. The um, best way is to go at it is find something you want to do and, and just go until you succeed. Oh, you yeah. Search yeah. It, you know. It's a lot easier if you have a particular problem in mind. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's Something's exactly why I yeah, asked you, the question. If I have an example Golang task, program. Is a surprisingly deep example task. <laughs> <laughs> Because I'm used to Java, and I feel like if I ask that question about the JVM, someone oh, go, it adds yeah. a million oh, you haven't plugged in yet. Okay. To oh, whatever. Sorry. I wasn't ready to share my screen. And I'm, I'm That's also true. You see, I don't know how pointers work. <laughs> yeah. Um. Oh, I mean, I can go first. Yeah. Go for yeah. it. Uh, can you guys see, was there anything on the TVs? Oh, yeah, let's I unplug it. We'll give it a second. How about now? You see me now? <laughs> what about now? How about now? Is it on the wrong input? 
You should mount a little mirror down there at the bottom of it. <laughs> that would that would be good. Oh, how about I plug it in all the way? How about now? There you go. Yay! <laughs> um, is that is my font okay? No. Cool. All right. You don't have to watch this anyways, but uh, because we were talking about VMware earlier, uh, this is VMware, and uh, for my demonstration, uh, for my demonstration here, I am running a uh, OWASP server called Juice Shop. Uh, although I'm not going to be showing you that. I do have some slides that I've not put on my uh, system yet. But what I'm going to show you uh, tonight, is anyone familiar with Burp Suite? Raise your hand if you are. All right, well, this will probably be, uh, is everyone proficient with it? <laughs> oh, I'm not, so. Uh, no, I'm okay. But what I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you a real simple example. Um, one of the things that I did do with it, and I'm sure... Uh, we can get some great advice from Rich. But I used it when the COVID vaccination first came out or when it was finally available to the general public, you know, if, if you didn't have a special condition, just everybody. Um, it was quite hard to find an appointment or somebody because everything uh, just filled up. You would go online to CVS, Walgreens, whoever, try to book an appointment, and it was impossible. I couldn't, you know, we couldn't find one. So um, Walgreens had this thing where you could search, you know, near your house uh, by zip codes for a place that had an available appointment, but it would only do it uh, by 25 miles out. And uh, so I live here in Atlanta, Georgia. And so what I did is I just kind of automated everything through Burp Suite to find an appointment uh, for me. And then when an appointment came available, I would grab it. I did write an article about it, but I kind of waited until the vaccine was readily available where, you know, you could, anybody just could go in because I didn't really want anyone abusing it. Now, whether it's abuse or not, uh, Rich might be able to uh, do that. I didn't do anything I couldn't have done by hand. I just did it way faster than a human could. Is this open source RPA? Hmm? Is this open source RPA? What, what do you mean? Robotic uh, No. No, no, it's perfectly. I'll, I'll show you. We're going to do something similar. Um, but I, I don't know what the legalities of that is. Yeah, I mean, generally, if you can do something by hand and then you can automate it, then that's typically you're not violating anything. I mean, the big things that you want to worry about is are you accessing anything you shouldn't? Are you aggregating any information you shouldn't? Are you doing anything anywhere that someone might not want you to do? Now, that last one is a little bit of a distinction because it might not necessarily be illegal, but it's also a very important consideration that you need to ask yourself, right? Because if you are trying to protect yourself, one, am I going to, and, and, and number three, which, okay, thought, no, that middle figure, so I won't actually raise that by itself. I know. I, it's is, good. am I going to piss anyone off? Okay, and sometimes the answer is yes, purposefully, and that's okay, all right? But you need to ask yourself, am I pissing anyone off? And if you are, okay, am I willing to deal with the heat that's going to come from this? Okay. And then the secondary considerations are, is it illegal? Am I accessing anything I shouldn't have? Am I taking anything I shouldn't? Right. And so in this, in, so to answer your question, no, I think you've automated something. You're in the clear. Now, one thing, though, I did have to be careful of uh, because I could do this so fast. And I, I think, there, believe it or not, there are like thousands and thousands of zip codes in Georgia, I had no idea. But one of the things I did do is I throttled it down because I didn't want to cause any kind of denial of service because that would definitely be a problem and, uh, and Walgreens would shame me for it. Can everybody see this? I made slides. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, don't try this at home. Uh, there's a, I'm gonna tell you some other practical applications that you could do with what I'm showing, but I don't recommend trying it. Um, I actually explained uh, this part, what I uh, used, and I made this graphic, at least the green part. That is actually some of the text uh, from it. Is it not full screen? Yeah. Hold on. Oh, no, I'm using... Uh, I want to lay out. 
I, you know, honestly, this is the first time I usually do this all on the Mac. Yeah, view. This this is not PowerPoint. <laughs> this is uh, open source. Normal. Normal. Well, let me do. I think there's a way. There's a way to do. Um, oh yeah, I heard a slideshow settings. I I could do all this. I just can't. Yeah. No. There's a presentation mode. No, I was trying to. Uh, I was trying to do multiple displays. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No. no. Yeah, it's funny. I can't. I can't see what. It, tell me when it's right. How yeah. bad would it be to give up on multiple displays and just mirror? Mm, what is my? Yeah. Oh no, it, it's mirrored. I'm just trying to uh, get this down. Oh, keep this. This is one of my favorite things about being a lawyer that practices in technology. Is when I you got it. It's when I can't get like a Google Meet to work, and I'm on the phone with like an insured or a client. I'm like, hey, you need to trust me because of my technology expertise. And like, but I'm muted. <laughs> <laughs> right. So yeah, I can hack into slot machines and banks, but I can't work uh, <laughs> slides. Fact. Some of the easiest things. I'll call. Um, all right. So like I told you, uh, here was the problem I uh, uh, faced. Um, so um, let's see if I can zoom this. Uh, it says, "Let's check COVID vaccine uh, appointment is not available." This is what I was getting. Uh, I, I'm sorry if that's not large enough. Um, can everyone see that? Okay. Can you see the red thing? <laughs> that just like, nope, no appointments available for the zip code 30310. Uh, um, and that's the result I'm looking for. You'll also notice up here, or you might, you probably won't know, but it says not secure, and there's a reason for that. They talk, if you were here in the room last night, they talked about uh, man in the middle, and Burp Sweep kind of does that. I'm feeding all of the web data into uh, Burp Suite, which allows me to pause everything, inspect the traffic, modify it, send it back out. In order to do that, you have to sit between uh, the user and the server. So it's a, a self-created, in my case, man in the middle, where I can inspect everything. So obviously, I am going to accept an invalid certificate because I'm not going to hack myself. I'm so really sorry about this. Uh, what I'll do is I'll probably, I can show you this later, or I can uh, uh, show it to you when we do the demo. But basically what I had to do is I inspect everything that happens. So uh, they are calling right here. So the top highlighted uh, uh, one in the uh, uh, pink up at the top is basically showing that the website is sending information, or my system is sending information to uh, a Google to uh, an API uh, geocode service search, where they are trying to find out my latitude and longitude, and is there something within five miles that has um, service? In this case, um, I discovered right here, and down here on the right side is the response, and it shows latitude and longitude. So what I had to do was download every single zip code in Georgia. Then I had to go get the latitude and longitude for it. And I found one here at uh, data, uh, open, uh, datasoft.com. They have a lot of statistics, everything you can find uh, for stuff. And I was able to uh, download latitude and longitudes. Um, so uh, right here. I, I, there might be a way to, uh, for me to expand this. Let me, I just want to, let me do this here. Uh, how about, can you see that? Where it says appointments available, false. So I know that's what it looks like when, uh, when a appointment is not available. I can assume uh, when an appointment is available, it's true. So 
two things I could do. I could say, look for things and let me know when it's not equal to false or let me know when it equals to true. I uh, wasn't 100% sure about it. I did know where to find an appointment so uh, where I knew nobody was going to go. So I found a zip code in the middle of nowhere, Georgia, where I knew there was going to be any lines for uh, COVID uh, vaxes, but I personally didn't want to drive three hours out. Uh, so I use that uh, for my positive uh, sample. All right. So now I'm going to uh, do a demo. Demo time. Yay. Are we going to get vaccine appointments? Sorry? Are we going to get vaccine appointments? Yeah. All right. Maybe. <laughs> no, um, what, for the example I'm going to show, I'm going to show you the module I used. Uh, I'm going to show you the module I used. And basically what we're going to do for this is we're going to brute force uh, an, an administrator password uh, by cycling uh, through the logins a few uh, thousand times with uh, tons of different um, logins. And I have some work stuff there. Yeah, I'm gonna. You know what? I got an idea. Let's let's just let's just pretend that I am. <laughs> oh my gosh! Let's see what this does. Well, I know. Oh, uh, sorry. Let's go to the second screen here. Let's see if it'll let me do this. <laughs> nope. All right. Good idea. I've never had to do that. Here's what we'll do. Since I want If anyone ever tells you that prepping slides for something like this is easy, now no. you know the truth. Yeah, this is the problem with live demos. Uh, I'm Honestly, I've never, if it, I know how to do it on my Windows system, I've never had to do, I've never, pre oh, I'm sorry. Oh, let me get the audience up here. Let me go back to where I was. How's it looking now? Let's see. I feel like I just need to come out there and look at the screen. This is like flying from a uh, line. Let me go back to where I was, and then we'll go with your suggestion. Oh, uh, I don't know if they can for me. I just want to get something. So right now, everything looks like it did before, correct? Right, but is it everything look the same? At least I'm trying to get back to square one. All right, so we'll try it. Oh, half, all right. Uh, really? <laughs> yeah, you're going to. Sorry, go ahead. All right, custom. So you're saying I need to go down by half. So one of my early. Oh, it was too large, I see. Well, now I can't see. <laughs> Hello. I have, a, I have a modest suggestion. The visuals just aren't working. Why don't you talk to us instead and teach us? All right. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but it, that's no, no, the way no, it feels. No, no, no. It's fine. Okay. Or I could go later and let them do my, while I get my technical <laughs> stuff. And by I the mean, way, I really just showed you kind of. Uh, I was just going to show you a live demo of me brute forcing. I, uh, hold on a second. Well, now I don't have a monitor of me brute forcing a password. Um, we're here for a while. I can do it later. Uh, that part, uh, till I fix uh, my monitor. I can rotate the TV so you can see what it looks like. He can rotate the TV, maybe why these gentlemen are doing that. Uh, will that work? Especially if you're all the way in the back. There is always a solution. Okay. I'm, I apologize about that. Especially if it's alcohol. That's all right. Cause and solution to all the world's problems. So, 
one of oh, one of the first academic uh, computer science talks I ever went to as an undergraduate was uh, Ronald Rivest. Uh, for those of you who knows who he is, very very famous cryptographer, uh, was giving a talk. He started over an hour late because he couldn't figure out how projectors work. Um, so this reminds me of that. The hardest unsolved problem in computer science remains printers, but I believe the second hardest is displays. Uh, Maybe. I think for now, the third hardest remains P versus NP. Um, I think that's one of two remaining unsolved problems, different from hardest. Cache invalidation and naming things. And off by one errors, yeah. Two hardest problems. All right. Shall we, shall we go well? Yeah. Okay. So, um... We're going to go. We're, we're a little bit um, less digital. Um, so Rich here has kindly agreed to be a memory manager for us. Uh, he has no idea what he's going to do today. Yep, which, I have no idea what that means. Uh, the so. fact that I got him to agree to this without telling him what he was going to do makes me very happy. <laughs> yeah, does that constitute a social engineering attack? <laughs> Whatever it is, I can't be bribed with White Claw or Truly. Also works. Also works. Any alcohol works, if you guys didn't get that. <laughs> but, on, but honestly, I have no idea what I'm doing, so apologies. Okay, we also need a couple people up here from the audience to be programs. I see some, I see, oh, we have two very excited people. Okay, congratulations. That side. No, no, you need to be on this side. You're, you're, you're in the right places. Okay. Now I can't see this. So, for those of you, I'm sure there are, are plenty of you in this audience who know the basics of how a computer processor works and how different thread, wh threads work. But for those of you that don't know, when your computer wants to run two different programs at once, it runs them in what are called two threads. And you can't actually run two things at the same time on one core of a CPU. So there's a program called the scheduler that just tells each one when to run. So these are my two threads. I will be the scheduler. When threads need memory from the system, they have to go ask for it from a memory manager. This is my memory manager. So our threads are going to run a little program here. You can see it on the two sides, so you both can take a look. It's a little flowchart. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to ask for memory. And you're going to get either memory 1 or memory 2. And our memory manager here is going to give you either memory 1 or memory 2. And when somebody's using memory 1 or memory 2, he's going to put a little in use sign on it so that he knows not to give it to anybody else. Because it would be bad if two people were using the same memory at the same time. Um, and our, um, what our programs are going to be doing is just a little to-do list. They're going to go put their to-do list on the board, and then they're going to go do the to-do list one item at a time. Um, and as you can see, we have some, some tasks for them to do. Um, so we're going to go ahead and start scheduling them. Uh, yes, sorry. Uh, you can see there's this pointers here pointing to a part of memory. This is what's called an instruction pointer. It just tells them 
which instruction to run next. So uh, we were talking earlier about return pointers. This is a very similar concept, slightly different. Um, but either way, it's which instruction are they going to do next. So as you can see, the next instruction they're going to do at the start of the program is the first instruction to get their memory. So let's go ahead and start. So I believe you are thread one. Or you, uh, so go ahead and you ask for your piece of memory and receive memory slot one. Uh, memory manager, put in use on top of memory slot one. Very good. OK. Uh, and now you can move your instruction pointer down one step. Because you've taken that, you've done this instruction. Thank you. Right. So that's how it works. Now, they don't necessarily take one step each. He might take a second step. So go ahead and take your second step. Which is just to put your to-do list on the board. So just put them up there. Under the uh, in use, just one at a time. Doesn't matter the order. Well, maybe thread two. We'll take a step now. Uh, don't forget to move your instruction pointer if you didn't already. Oh, okay. Now, now our our thread two. And move your instruction pointer. Thread two again. Put your instruction, your to do list on the board. So at this point, our threads are writing to memory. This is all fine because they have that memory. Okay, uh, thread two again. I'm feeling generous. Thread two again. Take a task off the board. Oh, take a task off the board. Yep. Really? One of well. Move the instruction pointer down and do what it Yep. I'll do yes. There is. There are indeed uh, to do tasks left. So just take one. Okay. Don't do it yet, because you haven't been told to yet. Thread one, your turn. Move your instruction pointer down and do what it says. <laughs> and then thread one again. Yeah, move it down to, um, move it down to the next thing, which is do item, it should be. Yep. Um, what does your, your to-do task say? All right. <laughs> you only get one. <laughs> um, okay, um, and third one again. So now you're going to go back to the top of your loop. No, don't put it back on. You take, keep it. On. You've already done the to-do list item. <laughs> I, uh, yeah. Sometimes I have to put to-do list items back on, but I don't generally like it. So take, the take the other one off and hold it for now. Thread th two. Well, let's run you for a while. So thread two. Go ahead and take your your uh, do your task. Good choice. And move your insertion pointer down. Yep. And now. Take another step. You've already done your item, so. So now you take the next item. And now uh, I'm going to go ahead and give you a dollar so you don't have to donate your own dollar, or Isaac will. Uh, but sure. now go ahead and, and take your next step and do a task and donate your dollar. So take your step. Oh, like actually, like, oh, move it down. Yep. <laughs> well, nope, there's still... You just took that task, and now you're doing it. So now donate your dollar. Just in the bucket. Uh, Not in the water bucket. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> you haven't even opened the bottle yet. <laughs> Okay, now thread one, you do your next task. You already took the items, so do the task. And also make sure you get it in the right bucket. Um, 
It's not the bit bucket. Okay. So every time they did this, they were only able to do it because they had uh, access to this memory. They're, they're able to, we haven't been making them do it, but they've had this thing that they can show the memory manager this entire time. They can see that the memory manager can see that they have slot one and slot two, right? So now you're going to go ahead and free your memory. That's your next task, right? Yep. So just take off the end use and just give it back to the memory manager. You're saying, oh, I don't need this anymore. No, you keep that. You keep the, uh, the white thing. These are computers. This is the digital world. There are you, uh, there's never a, th uh, a token that you cannot copy. You can't be made to forget information. So he still has that information that he's at memory slot one. And we'll see in a moment, there's a mistake in this program, a bug that's going to cause him problems. Because we have here a malicious thread. And our malicious thread is now going to ask for some memory. I would like some memory, please. <laughs> now, there's only one memory slot not in use. Now it is in use, so our memory manager should go put that back on. All right. Better. And now, my, our malicious thread is going to go ahead and add something to that memory slot. Malicious thread? Thread one, time to take a step. Thread, thread one, when you're done taking out the item off the list? Have you taken the item off the list? Now it's time to do your item. Launch the missiles. Oh, I know it's <laughs> As you can imagine, this can be a problem. <laughs> this is what's called a use after free attack. What's going on here is that there's a mistake in our, our threads program that causes them to not actually finish with the memory once they've given up the memory, allowing our malicious thread over here to insert instructions that maybe they didn't actually want to run. Well, you should have given that up, and in, and in fact, Modern programming languages will force you to. So this is actually what Rust does. At the end of the day, Rust's big innovation is forcing you to give that up. And that turns out to actually be really hard. Um, the way that most other programming languages do this, like Java, is by never allowing you to actually touch that in the first place, except for when they tell you to. And that way, they can tell you to give it up. Um, but if you work in... Uh, programming language like C or C++ or assembly or if your Microsoft Windows operating system um, <laughs> which is written in, in those languages um, you don't have that protection and so you have to be very careful as the programmer not to make this mistake and you might think oh that's a dumb mistake I would never make that I'm a better programmer than that uh, you're not <laughs> don't kid yourself Python also forces you, doesn't let you touch these things directly. So we actually looked up uh, this year's, uh, who the hell keeps track of these things? Mitra. Mitra, Mitra. list of uh, most common exploits. Mitra, M-I-T-R-E. M-I-T-R-E, it is a... Uh, yeah, Mitra, it's a, it's a organization that keeps track, I think it's actually part of the U.S. government, I forget which branch. Um, MITRE. Sorry, I spent too long in Europe, and I got the French pronunciation in my head. Um, uh, but it, it actually keeps track of common vulnerabilities on the internet. And we found that use after free was right at the top of 2021's list, so we figured we should try and explain it. And if you've ever wondered, uh, if you've ever encountered the, the, say, Rust borrow checker, and you've wondered what it is that exactly that you're borrowing, or that individual function calls are borrowing, it's those pointers. It's exactly those that they are borrowing, not copying, in order to make sure that they can be destroyed when they're given up. All right. Thank you very much to our threads. You can keep that. And also, okay. and also thank you to our memory manager. He uh, actually did not know what he was going to do. I'm still not sure what actually happened, so... <laughs> How are you doing over there, Ducky? Oh, yeah. Come by. I've made it worse. 
Oh. Well, let, let's give Ducky a little bit longer. Do, does anybody have any questions about anything they would just like to ask? I'm yeah, I heard. Um, or I did some reading that uh, there's some conflict, conflicting uh, opinions about if using a VPN through Tor um, would would make you less anonymous uh, through Tor, or I wouldn't think it would. But some of the readings say you should use Tor just straight up without VPN. I don't know if you have any thoughts on. I guess it depends on whether your VPN makes you sign in. Uh, first of all, I mean, if you have to sign in, they still get to see your sign in information, right? Um, but I, I would guess it depends on the VPN in particular. Yeah, something, at least from a legal perspective, is unless you're doing your own VPN, I would not trust any third-party VPN provider. And anyone, okay? Because I can't tell you, so I work in, primarily in the cyber insurance context, and I've seen a lot of my clients um, use third-party VPNs that then have been breached. And then it's like, oh, we don't have logs. It's like, hey, guess what? We have logs. And so, um, it's uh, you know I have a VPN at home. I'm not that technical, and you can set it up on your own. It's not that hard. Um, but you know, whenever you're entrusting your data to another entity, you want to be cautious. And Tor is a great tool, um, but Tor also, from a regulatory framework perspective, is under attack. Um, you have several nation states, including the United States, that are actively looking at ways to potentially see Tor traffic. Um, so anything you can do to secure that would be beneficial. If they did have, if they did use a VPN that did have logs and said they didn't, do they have any recourse against? I them? mean, potentially, but again, read the terms and conditions. Um, but at that point, what's the greatest harm, right? The fact that those logs exist and may be published, and the type of data that you're reviewing, like if you're an Iranian freedom fighter. Right, and you're using a third-party VPN that then you know discloses logs that says, "Hey, you're communicating with such and such," and then you get, you know, executed. Like you're kind of fucked, you know. So um, I, I was told after 10 p.m. I can swear. So okay, sweet. Um, so I mean, it's really one of those things with a lot of things from a legal perspective of what are the damages to you and what type of damages can you recover. Right, and if the damages to you are much greater than the damages that you can recover from a third-party entity, not and part of that damages calculus is how much is it going to cost you to recover those damages. You gotta you gotta weigh that as part of the calculus, and when you're entering into an agreement or services, you know, being provided by a third party. I would point out when it comes to picking a VPN, I mean, this is this this is the point from which all of your connections to the internet will spawn. Um, so if you're if you trust them more than you trust your house, and however your house is trusted the internet, then that's one thing. Uh, but I, I guess Rich would argue they're not necessarily automatically more trustworthy than however your house is connected. Not at all. I mean, again, like I, I, I believe it was someone in Ronald Reagan's organization that said, "Trust but verify." Right? When it comes to your personal data, don't trust. Maybe, but I haven't verified Comcast either, so. <laughs> Well, I mean, right, but the thing is, is you can set up a VPN that makes sure that Comcast doesn't see anything, you know, like, well, they can, I mean, in, for the, the video, the gentleman said they can still cap their data, but I mean, here's the thing, right, data privacy is hard, it's hard, right, and if you want to be a data privacy maximalist, you're going to have to do a lot of work, you're going to have to deprive yourself of a lot of things, so either A, you do that, or B, you go into things eyes wide open and say, hey, they're going to know what I'm doing. They're going to understand what I'm doing. They're going to do what I'm doing. So then at that point, you're either okay with it or if you want to keep certain segments of your life private, you go through that extra effort. My point is just either Comcast is going to see which servers <laughs> I connect to or Proton is going to see which servers I connect to. And Unless you're on your own, well, which e is actually okay. quite technically difficult. Like it's oh. not, it's not do it right. It's I mean, e even if I run my own, it has to connect to the internet through someone. And where I live, that means it connects to the internet through Comcast. So... And, and I should say that I'm not that... I don't want to Dunning-Kruger myself, right? Like, I do have a VPN on my home network. Um, maybe I'll chat with you guys later, because it might not be set up right if it's that difficult, because I don't trust myself <laughs> to do difficult technical things. Um, but Yeah, I mean, look... It, it, I, I, I'm going to stand in for another one of the common panelists here, Kurt, and just say it all depends on your threat model, too. Like, if you're doing something that you actually...
care to keep private, what Richard's saying is absolutely right. I, at home, do not... I mean, and at work, I, I like I said, I do defense work. I don't have a lot of things uh, that I really particularly care about Comcast knowing about. I would prefer that they don't know about a lot of things, but I'm not willing to go through the amount of work that Rich is suggesting. Which is, I mean, for my line of work and what I do in my personal life, I've decided that's fine for me. This is a decision I've made. I think that's Rich's point. Exactly, right? Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, so I, I like... I like fuck around with like the technical side of privacy as like a for fun thing because I'm trying to teach myself because if I'm advising people on how best to secure their data, I want to at least have some type of technical knowledge. And so in, in, in the way I do that is trying to protect my data. Right. And so I may or may not do a good job of it, but again, it, it takes work and effort. And again, if, if there's something that you can do on your own, on your own hardware, even if that is more technically difficult, that is going to be much greater than, you know, saying, hey, to this third party, you know, obviously you can't <laughs> create your own ISP because the American government hates us. But, yeah. you know, like y you are going to have to connect to the Internet somehow. Right now, if that's, you know, a burner phone connection, you know, tethering your personal computer to it in a you know, a public area 300 miles away from where you live. I'm not going to throw, throw shade on that, you know, but, um, again, like from Decide like a on bit, how much you're willing to yeah, pay. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, I think maybe we should move on to the next question. Uh, while you've, while you've mentioned tour, I'll be aware that the tour project routinely prioritizes ease of use and low latency over security. For instance, by default, it uses one entrance node, one intermediate node, and one exit node. I mean, the first thing I would do is make it use a dozen mixing nodes on the middle. Wasn't it so, by US government? Who was this? What? Oh, Roger. Uh, I know the gentleman who made it. Uh, Roger and Nick. Um, anyway, uh, if, you, know, if you install your own VPN and keep your own passwords instead of having some company have them, uh, that'd be a lot more secure than Tor in my book. Also, I want to recognize the guy for wearing the Gengar shirt. Thank you, my favorite Pokemon. <laughs> and my question is, uh, it's 2022. What's the most havoc I can cause with a single BGP packet, and how do you recommend I pull it off? I think our, our two gray hats are a little occupied at the moment. <laughs> Oh, BG I, I haven't touched BGP wait, wait. in like world domination years. or COVID shot. Come on, <laughs> <laughs> world domination. Well, yeah, my demo was also going to show you how to get free uh, high speed internet at the hotel uh, <laughs> because there is also a trick, you know, in the captive uh, portals where it's like enter your room number and your name. Okay, you're signed on, or yeah, I want the extra fast one. Well, you can also enumerate that. I guarantee someone named Smith is staying in this hotel. So I can go through every single room number with the name of Smith until it says, okay, you're logged on. So uh, that's it. Yeah, well, some don't. But you can also uh, change your MAC address at a, a normal. Or, you know, you, you can uh, change your MAC address pretty quickly as well. That would be a time. I may have found a solution. Sorry, go ahead, sir. Oh, yeah. So, I'm curious if y'all have any war stories about this. So, about a couple of weeks ago at work, my upper management hired a very pretty girl to come in and uh, just social engineer her way into our office. And then she got onto our local network. She found root passwords flying around unencrypted on HTTP. HTTP basically just had us. Um, do y'all have any experience working in that kind of world where someone pays you to break into a office, smiling and waving at everybody, talking to people at the water cooler? Hmm? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I do it all the time. Oh, yeah? Uh, mostly casinos. I can show you that. I can show you pictures from that. 
have a whole presentation I did on that. So do you like actually like take a crowbar to a slot machine and wire into the motherboard yourself? Or how oh, do you no, I, do I'll that? man in the middle of it, uh, man in the middle. But as far as breaking into uh, casinos and getting behind them and stuff, I, I just wear what everyone else wears. <laughs> uh, the cameras, I mean, for that particular one, the camera systems, really watching the tables. I do have a presentation. I just did a presentation at B-Sides Atlanta. They didn't record it. So I am going to resubmit that, possibly for the next DEF CON or Black Hat or ShmooCon. So I won't say too much. Yeah, I haven't heard of ShmooCon. In D.C., isn't it? Yes, it's in D.C. You might be thinking of DerbyCon, but there's something replacing that. So I, I can tell you that um, at the companies I've worked at, like we very rarely deployed testing like that. Um, typically, it's when there's been very high like physical controls in place, and so they're trying to test those. Um, but generally, like it really depends on the business and industry you're working in, right? Like you're if you're a mom and pop accountant shop that doesn't have a lot of like, high profile clients. The chances of someone coming in and doing that are very like low, if not nil, you know. Um, but if you're, you know, an FBI, you know, department or shop, or if you're dealing with very high-profile clients, um, I've had a couple of cyber claims with um, accountants for people that every single person in this room knows um, who have had um, physical social engineering episodes, um, and they've lost hundreds of thousands and in some cases millions of dollars as a result of that so there is a time and a place for it um, I do think that a lot of entities kind of want that like crazy like oh we're gonna go 007 on these motherfuckers <laughs> like we're gonna kick their ass this is gonna be so cool and honestly a lot of times like it, it fails like they get caught right the only time you really hear it publicized is you know, you get these pen testers, they're like, yeah, I do this for a living, and I have five stories, and I've been doing it for ten years. You know what I mean? Because if some random person comes in most of the time, it's like, who the fuck are you, dude? Why are you doing here? Why are you on this computer? You know? So I think generally it's something that, that is used and is beneficial, uh, but at least personally in my experience, it's something that we would only use for very high-value targets. And then also, um, you know, Really, if if we think that there's very a, a high risk of social engineering, so I, I've never done that sort of work because I, like I said, I'm a defense person. But I can tell you, uh, at one point, I did some work for a, a company that will remain nameless, but that um, used to do, it probably still does, um, a lot of uh, what's called research bounties for the government. Basically, the government says. We want somebody to solve this this technical problem, um, and gets a whole bunch of companies to, to submit possible solutions, and then funds them part of, uh, part way, um, and then they have a competition to see which which one actually gets funding at the end. Uh, and as part of that, uh, Lincoln Labs at MIT, which is a national lab, uh, their entire job was to break every single submission as much as possible. Uh, they mostly didn't do that with software, with, with uh, uh, sorry, with uh, social engineering. Uh, they did do it with software engineering, um, but they they uh, that sort of red teaming, where you try to get somebody to actually go and attack every single part of the surface, is actually something that's used all the time in that sort of situation. Oh, interesting. Um, right. So real quick, everybody. Um, obviously, I'm a complete failure with uh, this one. But I do have a lot of slides and stuff from my just past B sides, which does cover social engineering. It's really talking about uh, corporate security versus casino security. Would you guys rather see that? I have some uh, pretty interesting slides uh, from casinos, slot machines. Uh, there's only one caveat. I got to wait till midnight because I just don't want it recorded because it's a talk that's not out yet. Is that cool? But I can also talk about some uh, some of those uh, key points uh, with the uh, social engineering. You guys want to hear about one of the stupidest funds transfer fraud claims I've ever dealt with in my life? Okay, so apparently a lot of companies like to put people on their websites as far as who's doing what, which is a really stupid idea. 
um, and one company in particular put who their bookkeeper was with their name, address, email, everything, right? So guess who gets an email from the office president? The bookkeeper. And guess what the email address was? Officepresident2016 at gmail.com. <laughs> Guess who said, hey, I need you to fund this wire transfer to this random place that you've never heard of, the office president. And so the bookkeeper actually goes to the actual office president who worked down the hall and knocked on the door and said, hey, boss, what about this wire transfer? This seems weird. He's like, pay it. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Two weeks later, this motherfucker wakes up in the middle of the night, literally, and is like, what wire transfer? (laughs) Calls the next day, turns it into his cyber insurance care. I handled the claim, and I'm looking through the email traffic. There was no business email compromise. We had an IR firm look and review at it. This motherfucker literally just emailed this bookkeeper and requested money. And uh, what was cool was Google actually caught the first email address and like marked him or something because... During the transaction, it went from like the office president's name with the email office president 2016 at gmail.com to office president 2017 at gmail.com. And still nobody caught it. In, in the two months I have had my email address at my current job, uh, I have at least three different times had my department chair email me to ask me to bring him gift cards from Amazon. Yep. <laughs> so I, I had a claim, I had a claim once where, um, Someone randomly emailed someone at this company and said, hey, it's the CEO. I need you to text me this number. And the person obviously was like super scared. and was like, which, number one, if you're super scared of your CEO, you may, might be working at the wrong company. But um, that's personal advice. But so the person's like, okay, hey, what's up, boss? Blah, blah. He's like, all right, I need $30,000 in Amazon gift cards. <laughs> Guess what did the person say? Any, any guesses? Sure thing. Where to okay. Go? <laughs> buys uses a, a corporate credit card to spend thirty thousand dollars on Amazon gift cards, and then emails each separate. Well, because what what's the limit on Amazon gift cards? Eight dollars. It's like it's like two or five hundred dollars or something, right? Do you know how many emails that is? Confirmation for Amazon gift cards sent each individual one to this bad actor, and then um, like two weeks later, like when they got their expense report came out and they got called in HR, they're like, "Oh, the CEO told me to do this." And they're like, you have the CEO in your phone. This wasn't the CEO's mobile number. Why did you do this? So long story short, people are stupid. Um, make sure that you're, you know, obviously I don't know if there's any, you know, defenders in here, but make sure you're actually educating individuals and, and letting them know like, hey, if anything seems weird, it probably is weird and you probably shouldn't do whatever this random person's telling you to. I will say that seemingly trustworthy financial institutions do s- like they're they're almost training people to fall for these sorts of things. They just expect us to well, do. Well, banks are just as bad, dumb. though. Like I've had funds transfer requests that were fraud. Okay, where it was like seven figures, and the bank's like, "Hey, uh, you just gave us this, um, you know, you just gave us the the wrong account number, and the address doesn't match. The name's wrong." And the person sending the fraudulent request is like, oh, yeah, it's this. I'm like, okay. And they just send it. I recently got a phone call that actually turned out to be legit, but it was kind of creepy at the time. Um, It was from my student loan servicer, and they said, hi, this is your student loan servicer. Can you please read us your social security number? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I recently... I recently opened a, a credit card with a, a reputable bank, um, and because it was through a, a furniture retailer, you don't pay the credit card bill at the reputable bank's website. You pay it at some like sketchy ass looking website yes. called like newcustomeraccount.com or something unbelievably sketchy. It's HTTP. It could easily be. I. It, it was so hard to believe that this wasn't a scam that I called the bank and nobody there would even even knew like what the URL of the correct place to pay the bills for this thing was. I should honestly just open a website that claims to be the place to pay bills for these cards and then half the people would just pay me. Yeah. No, I, I had one one really sophisticated social engineering scheme. Um, it was a CFO for a company in Florida. They got a random text message in the middle of the night, like 2 a.m. 
that said, hey, this is Bank of America. We have noticed some fraud in your account. Please contact us as soon as you can. And so they contact them in the morning when they woke up. They're like, hey, we're seeing these charges, blah, blah, blah. And the person's like, okay, I, I need to look into this, blah, blah, blah. And so they're like, all right. They spoke to like three different people. Okay, each person knew their bank account information, knew everything. And they're like, all right, we just need to secure your account. Can you please give us your password and login name? And then they go, all right, we're sending you an email with a PIN. Please give us that PIN for security purposes. Right? And they did this, and then they ended up getting bilked out of like $300,000 because of this. And they had another one. I love telling war stories, and we're just, you know, whatever. But um, these, like, social engineering people are getting really sophisticated. So a lot of cyber insurance policies will, requ will require dual authentication for any funds transfer fraud. Right? So if you're doing a funds transfer, you need to have a secondary method of authentication outside of the original receipt of, like, instruction. Right? So I had this one insured client who was like, all right, we need to verify on Zoom. And so the money was going to an Australian entity. These bad actors found a fucking Australian to show up on Zoom in 15 minutes. Okay, and we saw that there was an email compromise that was, I mean, it, it might have been spoofed, but, you know, coming from Nigeria. And then we saw some other logins from Portugal, right? But they somehow found a legit Australian person to show up on Zoom, verify the bank instructions, and then the money was sent. All right. My favorite are the ones that call my family um, and try to get information out of them. Like, uh, yeah, we're trying to reach Chris Petronco. Like, this is his mom. I'm like, God damn it, mom. Like, stop talking to them. And two weeks later, my accounts get hijacked. Yeah, it's um, bad. That's my favorite. It's bad. Yeah. I, 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 the dog whistle. I answer my phone, they start, and I just blow that whistle. <laughs> <laughs> so I... I will say, I think we are happy to continue to blather on and shoot the shit however long, but if you have any questions, please get up and, and uh, stand in front of the mic and we will acknowledge you quickly. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm still navigating through here, but I'll jump in. in a minute. Yeah. Uh, does anybody here use U-mail? No? <laughs> there are some very interesting voicemail recordings that you can get on there. And I use them a lot for scammers, but I'm going to let these questions go through. And if you would like to hear it, I'll play one for you. But go ahead. You mentioned defenders. Uh, any thoughts or suggestions, conversation around uh, the changing in culture within security and security processes within the IT community, trying to move it away from an adver adversarial conversation? Uh, I, that's a great question. Um, so. At least, so my my expertise lays in typically post breach, okay. So, um, and I take ownership from my clients and insurance. So, the adversarial context kind of fits for me, right? Yeah. Because we are being attacked, and you know, and it is very malicious. And so, to me, not so much. I'd be curious as to what the technical side people think, but. Um, a lot of times the only way to get um, non-tech people to understand the severity of the risk in cybersecurity is to scare them. So if you go to a cyber insurance panel or you know a breach response panel or something like that, and this is why I just like wax poetic with all those amazing examples, is because people want to hear the bad stories. Because a lot of times the only way people actually prepare stuff is if they hear those bad stories. Do you know how many times I've been on the phone with a CFO or CEO and like, hey, why did you have remote access without a VPN or any credentials or anything? And they're like, oh, I just didn't want to learn another password, right? And it's like, okay, well, you just got hit with Soda no Kibi and now your business is down for three weeks, right? And a lot of other times I'll get calls proactively from people and the only time they actually care about their cybersecurity footprint is when a friend of theirs or somebody else in their industry gets hit with a bad ransomware event or a bad email breach. So I do think, at least from a marketing perspective, in order to kind of get people to harden their security like footprint, like having that adversarial approach makes sense. But yeah, so I think I think it's important to recognize that there's kind of two layers of this problem. One is the sort of uh, on the ground IT layer, which is super important. I think. That's very much where Rich is working, and it is very much an adversarial perspective. The other is uh, 
the programs that are actually written that people actually exploit? And how do you get there to be fewer exploits? Um, and I think there are some real cultural issues, right? The idea that you're a super coder who never writes any bugs and therefore you can just get away without any safety wheels. No, please stop. We have the technology to help you be a better coder. Your compiler is smarter than you are. I don't care. Almost always. <laughs> um, Fight. <laughs> um, but uh, um, there are a, a lot of what needs to happen is we need to give up on this idea that we're just going to be smart enough to be able to eke out every bit of performance and we're just not going to pro program any bugs because we're smarter than that. When we need to use the technology that we've been developing for decades that helps us do that. 90%, over 90% of the bugs and programs that let people get in aren't super sophisticated. They're simple mistakes that people make because when you're dealing with tens of thousands and millions of lines of code, you're just gonna make a mistake. And your computer can help you check that and you just have to use the tools. Yeah, I mean, if you, yeah, no, I mean, and, and yeah, you, yeah. So here, here, here's the thing, right? Like, being hit with a cyber incident is kind of like I, I've said this like three times over the course of this weekend. So I apologize if this is redundant for anyone. Is like winning the bad luck lottery, right? You need a series of misfortunate, unfortunate events to occur for this to happen, right? Now. The goal is, is not because, and, and I've said this before, and I've had technical colleagues disagree with this statement, but to me personally, I feel like using the adversarial language, as defenders, we have to be perfect. As attackers, they just have to be lucky. Okay? And no one is perfect. Okay? So really what you need is, is you need to have layering, all right? Layering of protections. So if you really feel it's going to be a value add from a marketing perspective, to lay out every single person with you know check signing authority on your website, that's great. But you need to dual authenticate any any cha payment changes. You need to do stuff like that, you know. And so, really, the biggest thing that we're seeing is I think in close to forty eight percent of all cyber incidents that we're seeing right now, there's a business email compromise. Okay, that includes ransomware. That includes other system compromises. It's just not funds transfer fraud or business email compromises. Right? So the thing is, is, if you have MFA implemented and enabled on your email tenant, if you use G Suite versus Microsoft 365 or on-prem exchange, right, you are protected more than the, the normal person. Right? If you have an actual thing where you say, hey, there's three people at the company or there's 30 people at the company that can sign checks or authorize payments, you will voice verify each and every check payment or payment instruction over $500 every time using a, a, a contact information outside of the payment change request, right? Or the payment request. So there's ways to safeguard that outside of like, you know, blanketing your, your website. It's just a lot of people don't understand that, you know, in, in the hacker spaces, I'm sure these people can talk about, you just need the smallest little bit of leverage, right? So if you can deny these black hats, this leverage, you're gonna be in a better position. Right. So I'll add on, on to that um, uh, case. Um, I also do forensics. One, and I was about to ask you, was this in Nevada? Um, you know, one uh, attack that just happened that I worked on, they lost uh, pretty much about $1.8 million. Uh, they went to a charity. What they did is, um, uh, well, basically we're not sure exactly where the compromise happened, but they got into the uh, CFO's email system. And then what they did is they made Microsoft Outlook rules to forward all emails that went to him to theirs. And then they sent emails to uh, the people who write checks and say, hey, this person's gonna contact you, write them a check. And they say, are you sure, blah, it all, they were communicating with that department uh, to him through his email, his compromised email. 
And when he found out about it, you know, a few days later, they're like, hey, we sent that last check. And he's like, what checks? Um, but, you know, as Rich was saying, you know, there are things you could do, especially when you're dealing with a lot of money. You can have a two person, you know, it takes two signatures. Uh, in this case, everyone in accounting got the email. Right. Uh, but definitely like voice verification. Like, uh, um, like it's 1986 of this bitch, bro. Right. Like 1 800 collect that motherfucker, you know? Like actually reach out and touch somebody. Because, exactly. you know, but something too is like we've even had 2FA on uh, Microsoft Exchange, Microsoft 365, like invalidate. I don't know if you guys have seen this with like Microsoft Graph, where they can kind of, so, so Microsoft Graph, like it, it, from what I understand, it's like a program that within the Microsoft's Outlook suite or something similar, again, don't want to Dunning Kruger myself. This is what the technical people told me. You don't you don't need two FA to access it, but then you can gain access to email accounts via it. Okay, and so something to keep in mind is you know do you have MFA implemented and enabled? Are there any legacy protocols that don't allow for that? Right, because I can't tell you how many claim calls I've been on where our, my client or the insured is like. Yeah, no, we have we had MFA implemented on this email account. It's like, all right, well, it was compromised. And then, you know, two or three days later, they're like, oh, yeah, this was the one account that it wasn't enabled on, right? And so any security professionals in here that are managing anything for any clients, make sure it's implemented and enabled everywhere because I want to say on 80 to 90% of any funds transfer fraud, any social engineering frauds that we're dealing with, there is a business email compromise and they're leveraging um, confidential or proprietary information in email conversations to prove that they are who they are, even if they're emailing from a spoofed email account. Um, so actually, I have a follow-up question to that, and then I want to ask my other question. So, uh, Rich, I feel like you might have an opinion on this. How do you feel? I have many about- opinions. <laughs> Oh, SMS texting M- MFA is trash. Okay. Yeah. I nice. wrote an article on that. There's a service out in India. You can pay to have that rerouted. That's like trash. for five bucks. <laughs> pure trash. I'm the CFO of bigmoney.com. Yeah, no, it's, it's yeah. pure trash. I mean, you definitely don't want to use it. Um, you know, and, and when, honestly, like NIST, ISO, other places have come out against it. Um, you know, it, it's just, it's not something you want to rely upon. But again... The thing is, though, is what's going to be best for the general populace, right? Like if you have an SME, a small or medium enterprise, what are the chances some big bad hacker is going to say, hey, John Smith Accounting getting you, okay? No, it's not going to happen. Like all the times I get calls up and they're like, they intercepted my emails. I'm like, no, they didn't intercept your emails. There's no one outside in a ba- you know, in a van packet sniffing your email communications, okay? Like you you compromised your email credentials all right so it's about um solving the common denominator right so sms mf sms mfa can be very beneficial for small businesses because it's more than just their regular credentials which they're likely reusing on third-party websites which are likely breached and there's some you know script somewhere that's just trying to get access to stuff a secondary method of authentication, like you know, I know people have issues with like Google Authenticator. Authy just had an issue, um, you know, other things like that. But you know, a, a separate and again, this might be something for you guys more technical than me. But there, there are um, hardware two-factor authentication code generators. YubiKey, yeah. There are, um, I'm not get that my YubiKey is well, the it, do. But again, like but SMS, right? So you have a secondary method of authentication. What are the chances is that you know, unless it's like you're a Vanderbilt, right? Like, right. Yeah. So the, I think the chances of someone actually going and saying, "Hey, I'm gonna try to spoof your grandma's cell phone number," are very really low. I think it, it is benefit, better than nothing. Yeah, Sorry. cost benefit is really important here. Mm-hmm. When you're dealing with your grandma, you do the better than nothing right. approach. You don't do the perfect approach because your grandma's never gonna do the perfect approach. Well, yeah, I mean, I maintain all of them, so right. I'm not well, then but use Google Authenticator, bro. It's used. We have to worry about. <laughs> I, I will say this in defense of the authenticator apps, uh, basically anything but SMS. If you have to change your phone number, especially if you have to change it, say, moving abroad, 
it's a huge bitch when everybody wants you to authenticate on your old phone number. <laughs> Some places won't yeah. accept Google Voice as SMS I mean, verification, as though. As long as it's verified before enrollment, then it will pass the MS SMS code verification. No, so TIL, motherfucker. Afterwards, then you can still continue to get it. it okay. Be yeah, you're talking about then transferring your phone number, right? But no, I, I'm so, so essentially, if you have, um, so purposes of the video, um, hi, um, gentleman was saying that you could actually get SMS verification using a Google Voice number if you have verified that number pre-port to Google yes, Voice. Exactly. Okay, cool. You said you had a second question. Yeah, so uh, are any of you familiar with the website Threadfeed? Like the thing where you download a program, like, hey, reverse engineer this and make it do a thing? I've, I think I've seen it. I've heard my students that say that they are playing with it. That's about all I know about it. I was just curious if I should like air gap or Raspberry Pi to like go figure these things out or just downloading it on my machine with my bank account is good. I would recommend at least a VM. Um, <laughs> at least. Uh, I think you know the answer to that question. Raspberry Pi would be better. <laughs> Thank you. Looks legit. Green text on the black background. Nothing wrong with this website. <laughs> Yeah, so programming education is, is a big deal. Uh, okay, let me, let me start with the first part of the question. Is there a open source code auditing software? Uh, there's a lot for different ones that you, for different things that you might care about. So it's really important when you're dealing with this stuff to have a threat model in mind. Right? You have an attacker model and you're trying to defend against that. Um, if you just try to defend against somebody, you're never going to succeed because that's not a thing that you can do or say anything about right so um the big but the big thing is a lot of times it's actually built into the language that you're writing in at least a lot of the ones i work with i mean that's my research so that's my bias <laughs> that's what i i know about it's built into the language huge number of the attacks that come out today are people writing in c and messing up memory management <laughs> memory management in c is hard to get right and i mean the the thing we showed you today, that's number one attack right now. Um, there are a lot of things like that that are just slightly different ways to mess up your memory management. Using a, a language with managed memory can really help with that. Uh, ideally, it would be perfect. Uh, it depends on, on the particular language, how perfect that is and how much trust, but there's some very technical questions about trust that we can get into there. Um, but if you want to, but for, sorry, um, but for different languages and different threat models, there's a whole bunch of different ones, um, and you have to look up the right things. Most of them are open source. Do you have any like off the top of your mind that you can think of? Uh, uh, Code Sonar is not open source, uh, so um, Code Sonar, but Code Sonar is a very very good one for C uh, if you're willing to pay some money. Um, I think new new. Has on the name at the what, what, what is it for reverse what? Oh uh, no, it's 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 for checking. Uh, well, uh, the Valgar. Valgar is checking your memory, memory usage and making sure you're trying to make sure you do it. Right. Uh, uh, bug, debugging tools. Uh, uh, Valgar checks a run, so it's what's it's what's called a dynamic check instead of a static check. Um, so it's it's not going to be perfect, um, but it will help out a lot if you have some potential leaks. It, it can find them and often does so yeah I mean, the Valgrind's one to check out but there's a lot of them out there depending on what you you want to do I mean we use it in New York as well um, it's it's really good from what I've heard from people. So yeah, the the, the things I've heard are, are mostly good. I mean, I I'm not sure I trust my the IT group at the university to have actually got covered everything. <laughs> um, but that's a different. I, I know I know I the, I I work with 
IR professionals, and, and that's one that they recommend. So, because there are some issues with Google, Google Authenticator that um, are pretty wide, widespread and well known. Um, but Duo, I think, as an enterprise solution for MFA is, is very well regarded. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it really just depends on your threat model, and that is partially going to depend at the university level on how sensitive of research uh, your, your professors yeah. are working on. I know that NIST has kind of relaxed some guidelines lately, like specific with like password changing requirements and other things like that, right? And so, again, not trying to speak from an overly technical perspective, but what I tell people when they're like, hey, you know, what should we do? It's like, you know, hey, if you're logging in from a new IP address, you should have to redo your MFA, okay? Because frankly, the chances of a keylogger or someone installing malware on your computer that's going to like get access and be able to run something from the same IP address you're at are really small, you know? So, but again, you know, as Andrew said, it's really going to be dependent upon them. Um, I have seen a lot of entities that get crazy and they're like, all right, we're changing passwords every eight weeks. You need to use MFA That's every a sign on. Idea. No, I, I don't disagree. But like people are like, oh, great way you to need get a, passwords you, written down. Yeah, you, you need you need it. You need a 12 character non sequential eight different type symbol password that you need to do every three days. It's like ridiculous, you know, so that, that and that's something recipe. that like like NIST is doing and trying to advise upon and make it a little bit easier, right? Like pass phrases versus passwords are like way better, right? So, but thank you for the question. So, I mean, the, the reality is, the way I would judge a bad practice is if it almost always, or not always, costs more than it's worth. Um, and, and, and it is surprisingly common. Uh, my favorite one of these is actually not a security one, a, a computer one, a digital one. It's a physical security one, which is almost everything the TSA does. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, it's, it's, I mean, at some point, you, you as an individual, you kind of have to deal with it. The, uh, depending on where you are in the system, you just have to live. Um, and sometimes you just live your life and, yeah, you could have done better than that guy, but that guy made the decision. As the person in charge of that decision, I think, um, well, I think that you have to really care about making that decision well, and I'm not sure that's the case a lot of the time. I think a lot of the time they're making the decision that's politically convenient rather than the decision that's technically convenient. And if I knew how to solve that problem, I would not. I, be I here got a right now. I got a resolution for you. You get fucking hacked. <laughs> I right? wish that like, worked. Like you, like I want to. I want to like graph like cybersecurity has... or IT spend after an incident versus pre-incident. Okay, because to to your point, those bad practices will exist until they are penetrated. Okay, and and that's that God's honest truth because 
again, I can't tell you how many companies I deal with post breach who are like, yeah, uh, we had remote access into our net, you know file server without any additional login credentials or MFA or anything, and oh, we didn't have MFA on our emails. Well, yeah, okay, you got hit by this really bad ransomware. We ended up paying five hundred thousand dollars, and your business was down for three weeks. And now they're like, all right, MFA, EDR on every endpoint. We're gonna have our managed sock. We're gonna do all this stuff, right? And so people will not, and, and maybe this is like a human issue, right? Um, and a sociological issue because people, if it's working, and especially in the SME context and even in the larger context too, they're not going to, to mess with what's working if it doesn't hurt them. But going back to what we said earlier about uh, changing passwords all the time, it's it, you can go too far as, to, as well as right. not far enough, right? If you make it so that no, that everybody's in your company is going to be trying to work around your security, right? you've now made your security worse by making it better. Yeah, but changing passwords all the time is just like an automated function, right? So it provides this kind of facade of cybersecurity, especially with people that aren't technical, because it's like, oh, we're changing our, uh, I've literally been told this, I don't know how many times, oh, we change our passwords every 10 weeks. We don't understand how we were breached. It's like, okay, well, you've done no phishing training. Um, your CFO is an idiot. And you have remote access into port 3830 without a password requirement. So it's like, okay, like this is why you're breached. It's not a changing of passwords. It's other bad security practices, which especially post COVID got even worse, right? As everyone moved to a remote work environment and you didn't have kind of this kind of like inside the box kind of network for people that were actually on prem. Um, but yeah, I mean, to, like I said, to answer your question, at least anecdotally with my experience, um, it takes a bad event for them to actually focus on cybersecurity. No, it, it totally is, oh, yeah. but <laughs> it, it's it, but uh, it's so crazy though because like, and I don't know if they're lying or not, but I've literally been on so many calls where like we're implementing MFA on our email tenant this week. And it's like, all right, so the first person you didn't implement it on was your CFO, right? Like you focused on every person that didn't have check writing authority before you implemented it on the person with check writing authority. Well, yeah, they're the hardest person to annoy and get away with it. Right. Well, yeah, that's that's You're, also true. The C-suite's tough. They're the ones who like, no, not I, me. I legit had a, <laughs> so I, I used to work for a cyber insurance company called Coalition actually up to this past Friday. And they do some really, really cool stuff where they, nope. Our new job on Tuesday, um, but they um, they do some really cool like scanning of like domains, and one of the things that they can see is remote access. And so I got a claim in. It was a really bad ransomware claim. Completely encrypted their entire network. Backs up backups were toast. Really really bad. And so I look at our scanning and I saw that we had actually notified their CISO four times that they had remote desktop access on this one port. And so I called them up on the initial call. A little salty, right? Because I shouldn't be here. Because we obviously know where the ransomware came in. And they're like, so you can use Shodan or Binary Edge to like search for this type of access. And they're like, oh, yeah, the, the CEO didn't want to remember an extra password. So we just kept it open for him. And I'm like, you guys know that's probably where this ransomware came from, right? And they're like, yeah, we know. <laughs> Have you ever wanted to shoot yourself in the face at work? <laughs> <laughs> this was one of those moments. <laughs> no, me, because I had to listen to that fucking comment. I, I just worry that the... I can't do that. That would violate customer service. I just worry yeah. that the response... Yeah, 99% the first time customer. Yeah. Yeah. I just worry the response after some of these incidents is to do the thing that feels more secure as opposed to the thing that is more secure. To implement the password rotating policies and to tell people that their passwords need to have, you know, no no characters next to any letters and to <laughs> tell people they're only allowed to log in while wearing a hoodie or, you know, whatever the... I, I remember I was in, uh, so my, my wife was giving birth and we were at the hospital and, and you know that the, the insurance person comes around because they have to get their pounds of flesh and as a cybersecurity data privacy person, I got a big kick out of the laptop that was being wheeled around with the thing on the top of the laptop that said PASSWORD in all caps <laughs> with this like 16 digit crazy password underneath it. 
And I'm like, oh yeah, that's that's not helpful. So if you ever if you ever uh, want to look at some of the easiest to read but most fun scientific papers you'll you'll find in computer science at least, look up the area of usable security. So this is the area that studies how humans actually interact with the security systems we set up, and it is fascinating how hard it is to actually get security systems that work and that humans will work with. Um, and that that's kind of what I was... Yeah, I mean, this right. is Isaac's point, uh, my point earlier about the, the passwords as well. Like, it, it's easy to focus on security. It's a lot harder to focus on security that works. Right, and people are stupid. Uh, you're, like, talking about, you know, uh, there has to be a balance between usability and security uh, for it to be successful. Yeah. Douglas Absolutely. Adams says this bit in one of his Hitchhiker's Guide stories about um, people getting so fed up with all the stuff they had to do to identify themselves that they, uh, in, in various security systems, they bypassed them all with the Identity Ease card. It contains DNA samples and fingerprints and knows all your passwords. And to get around the fact that people would then add more security to make sure the right person is using the Identity Ease card, they just declare that the legal identity of that person is whoever is holding the identity ease card. <laughs> Don't encourage your users to make an identity ease card. <laughs> We're getting real close. <laughs> Here's Yell. Try to, uh... Test. Yeah, oh, wow, I can actually yep. hear okay. now. Well, sorry for everyone else that asked questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to go back to the uh, uh, the use of, of SMS as a two-factor auth method. Um, and uh, uh, I, I understand that, they, that yeah, it's going to be more convenient for, for the, the grandma set. You know, you're not going to get them to use better methods. Um, but one thing I've noticed that frustrates me is just about every bank I interact with only supports SMS for two-factor auth. And it drives me insane, and I'm wondering if there is an actual reason for that under the hood. Like, for, for not so much for using SMS, I understand why, why to make SMS available, but why nothing else is available. Because banks are somehow the worst at cybersecurity, and I don't know why. <laughs> no, because they don't, they don't want to change their infrastructure because they have spent billions of dollars on implementing MFA via SMS and they they don't want to spend the money to upgrade it. It's and a purely capitalistic decision. And in the my gay, opinion, like the companies running my gaming accounts don't mind spending that money cuz like the security on my gaming account is I was going to say on my bank Steam account. being more secure than a bank that is sad. <laughs> yeah, that that, 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 that <laughs> no, but it's probably true though. Yeah, yeah <laughs> probably also I looking mean, at statistics yeah. and uh, you know the cost, and and like um, I forgot who was saying it before. You know the S the attack against SMS. You know with especially like bank accounts is more of a targeted account. Uh, yeah, where you're where it's a targeting where you're targeting a very specific person, and for them to spend you know the millions and billions of dollars to secure everybody when it's really just a very small that you know that's probably how they're rationalizing right. it. I suspect it's a cover your ass thing. Um, Banks are very afraid of getting sued for having not good enough security. This is very different from being afraid of not having good enough security. Because you can't get sued for having not good enough security if it's already been established by some finding or some sufficiently authoritative uh, ruling or lawyer that something is good enough security. So at some point, someone decided SMS-based two-factor authentication was good enough. Well, it, it was it used at one point, and right? And now, like, it was no bank is afraid, it, no bank will do anything else for fear that they will be the guy who didn't do the thing that was known to be good enough. No, banks aren't exactly on the cutting edge of things. And this is why your doctor uses facts. <laughs> <laughs> well, so arguably, though, like I've had funds transfer fraud claims literally avoided because the, the realtor or whoever you required payment change instructions to be sent via facsimile. So... I mean, sometimes, honestly, in a lot of ways, going I, I wouldn't consider facsimile analog, but a lot of the ways to combat a lot of the cybercrime that we're seeing is kind of going analog, like mailing checks, um, verifying addresses in a, a, a white book, digital or otherwise, right? Like calling someone on the phone. Um, but to your point, like 
you know, we are seeing newer companies that have these other like MFA type authentication methods that they use. But, you know, as Ducky said, the thing is they don't want to spend the money to potentially stop, you know, 0.000001% of their loss because frankly, they don't care. Like, again, like I've had funds transfer fraud claims where the bank literally took in, used an account number, the account name did not match, the account address did not match, okay? It was a company that sent the same amount of money to the same entity every every like month for like five years, and all of a sudden it goes to a different bank in China, <laughs> and it's a local bank in like Idaho, okay? And the bank's like, okay, well, let's send this money to China, right? And then my, my client, says hey aren't you guys at fault for this and like no it's like how have we ever sent a check to china you know and and there's not frankly you do have some protection with electronic funds withdrawal um in the united states but for a wire transfer instruction a lot of times banks just throw you the middle finger and say all right tough luck so i don't think they really care to be secure they're just doing kind of similar to what y'all said about the base minimum at least for appearances but I will say that that is changing a little bit. We actually have been able to recoup recovery on funds transfer fraud matters from banks, and that is getting more and more likely, especially as you're getting some plaintiff bars, some plaintiff attorneys that are saying, oh, wait, I can actually go after these large banks when I have an unsophisticated you know, client that's sending these large transactions. Like, you know, I have a 100-year-old client that just requested the $200,000 payment to somebody in Nigeria. They've been banking with this company for 50 years. And you're just going to process that without talking to anybody. So. Thanks. No, thank you. Well, so I have a simple one. Andrew, since I see you. You can wearing... try to. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the squat down a little bit. <laughs> Andrew, since I see you're wearing a task spot shirt and you gave the free after use. Uh, demonstration do you happen to have like a particular like game exploit that you, you know where taskbot may have used free after use to do something oh that's an excellent question i wish i had looked this up beforehand <laughs> now that you ask it oh man you're more creative than i am um i i don't know i mean i know there's a lot of things like that that go on in the old uh especially the game boy original game boy games because they were so clever at packing things in super hard uh, they did not do a lot of protections. A lot of them are buffer overflow because that, I mean, that's just what that is. But I, I, I mean, they may have had a place where they missed a free after use check too. I wouldn't be shocked, but I, I don't know off the top of my head. But that's a great question. I thought it was a buffer overflow, but I don't know for sure. The classic, um, the classic missing no Pokemon attack is a buffer overflow. Uh, yeah, it is. It's storing it past the end of the Pokedex, so it's literally like the Pokedex is a buffer, and we're going to the overflow. That matches my memory, yeah. Um, I wanted to make a comment about the whole legality stuff. So PCI compliance is the bare minimum that anybody has to do to not get sued. It does not necessarily mean you're secure. It just means the company will not get sued because they met the government requirements. Well, real, real quick. So PCI compliance is not government. Okay. Okay. So PCI means payment card industry. And it basically is PCI DSS, payment card industry, something, something, system and standards. So essentially, whenever you sign, if you want to actually use credit cards or process credit cards, you have to sign a merchant card agreement with the payment card industry. And as a basis of that, you warrant that you will mandate certain privacy and security protocols. So um, it's not the government mandating it, it's actually a private entity, and you enter into a contractual relationship with them where they say, hey, if you violate these privacy or security protocols, we can fine you. Okay. So, so but that still doesn't mean you're secure, it just means, okay, we're not gonna fine you, right? Right, right. It's all right. a dog and pony show. <laughs> yeah. I mean, PCI, HIPAA, I mean. Well, hip, HIPAA is. Well, well I mean, they have this guy on this, like, so, yeah. So HIPAA. Uh, Target was PCI compliant. So HIPAA is a little bit different because the people who wrote the HIPAA stuff, they didn't actually have any technical controls available 
for anybody when they said, hey, here are the HIPAA requirements. So right. then everybody started struggling because they had no way to meet these requirements technically because right. nothing existed. Yeah, I mean, the, their, their <laughs> initial iteration of like the security rule was like, be secure. <laughs> right? And, and so, I mean, the government's not really good about being, you know, technical. They're getting better. CISA's putting out a lot of really good stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean. But CISO's new. I mean, what, two, ish, three ish, years? Yeah, I think that, no, I think they around a little bit. <laughs> and they lost their that. initial director, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the question that I had is, like, I don't really know a lot about the whole cyber insurance industry, because that's also relatively new. And right. so I'm kind of curious about how the compliance, because you're talking about all these horror stories. How does your company or the cyber insurance company say, okay, you didn't meet the requirements of the contract? So how secure or how much do the, the client have to do to at least show that they are secure? Or is that not actually written into Yeah, how? so typically most cyber insurance policies of any reputable insurance company um, will not mandate like controls or anything specific within their policy. Now, they might ask on an application, what type of controls do you have in place during underwriting to say, all right, what type, do you have MFA implemented on your email tenant? Do you have MFA implemented on any remote access into your, into your network? And other questions, how much person identifiable information do you handle? What type of industry are you in? A bunch of questions like that. But a cyber insurance policy is typically going to reimburse or pay on your behalf costs you incur after a security failure data breach or something similar okay so no cyber policies to my knowledge at this current time it may change will say all right hey before you provide coverage we need to verify that you did x okay it's really like all right we're going to verify that we understand the risk and exposure you have as an entity before we underwrite the policy and then once that policy is signed there's coverage going forward so even so, if they do something completely stupid, there's the, the company so, insurance company is going to yeah, pay it typically out. Typically, <laughs> stupidity is covered. Um, <laughs> it, it, yeah, well, because because that's what it's what insurance does, right? Like I, if you if you Rich rear end a motherfucker, right? Uh, yeah. Like your policy is going to cover it, right? Yeah. Like, but but sorry, I, uh, I was going to say I was talking with a uh, it's the same thing. I was talking with a fireman uh, once. And we were saying, like, you know, how do you get away with arson? Or how do you get away with, you know, burning down your house? He was like, stupidity. Just, you know, I was trying to clean my floor with gasoline. But but the thing is, yeah. (laughs) uh, yeah. You know, it's it's how you avoid arson is you... Yeah, you admit uh, that you did something stupid. stupid Instead of trying to get away with it. Yeah, I mean, but but here's the thing. 88% of all cyber incidents are human error, if not more. Okay? And so the thing is, is... An insurance policy should insure against multiple things. Negligence, which essentially is a legal term for stupidity, okay, is one of those things that they should insure. Now, most policies, cyber or otherwise, do not insure for intentional acts, right? Which is why there's a difference between using gasoline to clean a stain off your carpet versus using gasoline to start a fire in your kitchen, okay? Now, cyber policies do typically have exclusions for intentional acts. Now, most reputable cyber policies, market-leading cyber policies, those intentional acts must be con- uh, must be undertaken by a senior executive, right? So a reputable policy should have like what we call rogue employee coverage. So essentially, if you have a rogue employee that's like, yo, I got like massive social security numbers here, I'm gonna sell them on the dark web, which number one, dude's idiot, you can sell those for really cheap. You're not going to make any money there. But that's typically covered. Now, if the CEO of the company said, hey, um, I'm going to sell all this data from all my customers on the dark web, that like might Google? not be covered. Sergey okay, Brand, Google? No, if it's part of their mission statement. Oh. But does that answer your question? Awesome. No, thank you. Hi. Good catch. Is your mic is your mic on? He's a guitarist. Just oh, there it is. All right. Uh, so Andrew, uh, earlier you were talking about 
our, our Lord and Savior, the uh, rust crab, and, and uh, how it handles memory for us. And just thinking about that and going back to... So as someone who owns about 500 uh, Red Hat machines with about 10,000 Java processes running on them, and uh, the log for shell thing happening, what, like what November of last year or whatever, God help us all when that happened. Can you? Can any of y'all explain to me how the hell log for shell happened? Like, what was the thing that said, "Hey, I'm gonna flip this bit and I'm gonna run whatever code I want." Fuck you. <laughs> my, is that? Are you saying like, is that the log four J thing? Yeah. Well, yeah. So my understanding thing. is that that, and again, I'm I'm just going here some kind of tipsy, but. Like my understanding of that is that there's like one person that kind of manages the general infrastructure for that in like Nebraska or something and it, it's a legacy protocol so it wasn't like super secure from initiation right? yeah I mean so my, my understanding which I've not spent a lot of time looking into Log4j to be totally clear so I can only tell you what I understand great as all it's more than what I know I promise um, which it, but from what I understand Log4j actually uh basically asks your operating system, hey, let me write to this log. <laughs> um, and it turns out that Java does let you just ask the operating system to do all sorts of things. Um, and there's good reason to allow programs to do this. Um, but uh, when you do, you're generally giving up uh, giving up security uh, guarantees. So the way a lot of languages work, including Rust, actually. Rust, Rust does this, too. Um, and, and again, there's very good reason for it. Is it says, we give you security guarantees unless you call this code. Unless you call unsafe. Uh, in Rust, uh, in Haskell, it's unsafe before my O. I'm not quite sure what it is in Java, but I know it's there. Um, and what that does is it, it says, this is uh, me breaking out of the box because I swear I know better than my compiler. And like I said, you probably don't. But sometimes you do, and and um, then you have to be very careful because here there be dragons, right? And the person who wrote log for J wasn't careful in some way. I'm not entirely sure of. I mean, technically, it can be phrased as a parsing bug in log for J. Uh, there's a series of log messages that are supposed to be stored ultimately as strings, and you get to you get to stick a message somewhere in there, and you can include the moral equivalent of close quotation marks in your message and then the remainder of your message will end up being parsed as part of a data structure that you weren't actually supposed to have control over as the creator of the message and it turns out you can start sticking instructions there to uh, there to ask the operating system to start up a shell instead of feeding information into java or whatever it was supposed to do and, and you get your log for shell attack. from from like a, a post breach perspective log for j was really scary for about two weeks and then we realized it really wasn't that scary. Um, unfortunately, it cost a lot of money to get to that point. Um, there were some very large organizations that I can't name that were impacted by Log4j with some actually pretty intrusive access. Um, but the vast, vast majority of the Log4j, um, from my understanding, talking to multiple other people in the cyber insurance field that were actually handling claims and things like that was, was kind of a nothing burger. So the, the long-term solution to this actually uh, was being worked on for Rust in particular by some of my, my colleagues at my previous job, uh, where they were using really high-powered uh, mathematical techniques to make sure that where the standard library used unsafe it actually was safe, Rust just couldn't tell. And by actually making sure that they could provide that guarantee, it means that when you do the smart thing and, and only use unsafe via the standard library, which for most applications is, is actually what you want in Rust, from what I understand, um, then you actually are still safe. Um, and this is, was a really cool, is a really cool, it's an ongoing project. They, they actually, it's a ton of work. Uh, it's called Rust Belt. Uh, so you can take a look at that if you would like. Um, yeah, but it's a, it's a very, very large and, and very mathematically sophisticated project to make that work, which is, uh, I think, doing really cool stuff. I think the mic's off again. Oh, okay. Yeah, just, just chat. And after this, we are going to take a 15 to 20 minute break and reconvene because we need to shut off video equipment and all that good stuff and let people have a little break. They've been sitting for two hours. 
uh, there we go. So, um, based on what I just heard, what I just heard you say was uh, the attack was you're forcing the JVM to go, hey, make this system call for me, even though you you don't want me to do that. So, is it fair to say that? If I write my own syscalls going around the standard C library in whatever version of Linux I'm running, I can just do whatever the hell I want because I'm root? Well, you can run with whatever authority those syscalls are being executed from. So it, the, the beautiful thing about log4j is that usually what you're doing is you're running a, someone else is running a Java program with authority that I don't have. But for some reason, I do have the authority to stick a log message somewhere into that program. And if I can then break out of that, the bounds of that log message and uh, start executing stuff with the authority of the, the program itself, like arbitrary code, then I have in some ways escalated my privilege. Right. The famous version of this was Minecraft servers, uh, where you know the server, this uh, Minecraft server is running Minecraft Java edition somewhere. Uh, with some authority. Players obviously aren't supposed to have that authority, but it turns out that one thing that's logged is player messages. No! <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's a, a fancy version of a SQL injection? Essentially. Uh, yeah. It's, cool. it's, it's along the lines with most escalation privileges uh, through web is uh, access uh, you know, getting any kind of access with something that's running under root or privilege. Cool. Thank you. Okay, we'll take a 15, 20 minute break. Does that work for everybody? Yeah.